Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to be here uh, with you. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you over the next uh, 30 odd minutes about the Menhaden fishery. I suspect that most of you are at least generally familiar with the Menhaden. And uh, I began this work six or seven years ago, and it's just dragged on interminably. But I am fascinated by the Menhaden the more I learn about it. But uh, at the end of the talk, if you have any questions about what we've gone through, you can, uh, you can fire away. What's the advance? Uh, just to the right. The right. Okay. Well, there, she, there he or she is, the Atlantic Menhaden, Vibrusia tyrannis. Several other kinds of Menhaden uh, exist in the Western Hemisphere, mostly uh, on the East Coast of North America and South America and the Gulf. But I'll be focusing on the Menhaden that's endemic to New York waters. Most Americans never heard of Menhaden, but in point of fact, the Menhaden uh, has been the target species for what for many years, many, many years, has been the largest commercial fishery in the United States. These are landings in hundreds of thousands of metric tons. This is a lot of fish from 1873 until the re relative uh, uh, recent years. And you can see there's a peak in the 1960s, but um, this, this graph is mimicked in the graph of New York State's uh, fishery in many ways. Uh, up until about 1960, Menhaden, far and away the most important commercial fish in New York's catch. Of recent uh, years, the nature of the Menhaden fishery has changed somewhat. For most of recorded history, Menhaden fishing had nothing to do with getting food. The fish was caught for other purposes, industrial purposes. And it was the subject of an, a reduction fishery, reduced to its uh, constituents. And then those constituents uh, used for commercial or industrial purposes a small bait fishery. Many of you are fishermen, have used Menhaden for bait. Uh, that is the uh, product of a small persistent fishery that continues here in New York uh, up to the present day while our reduction industry uh, is gone. Some more bait landings. Just a little bit about the Menhaden. It's found up and down the East Coast. It's migratory. It's not a big fish. It spawns year round, depending on where you are. Winters off North Carolina. It comes up this way in late April or early May and leaves usually by November. It's a major forage species. Its ecosystem value is uh, very, very high. And this plays in very significantly to some of the recent uh, management actions taken with respect to conserving Menhaden. And there's a single stock along the US East Coast. The fishery has seen an evolution from pre-colonial days to the present. And we'll go through these different stages. The Native American use of Menhaden, a post-colonial beach seining era. And then the fishery moved offshore, uh, initially with sail and then steam, and finally gasoline and diesel-powered purse seiners. And all along, as I've indicated, there was a processing aspect to this fishery that uh, makes of it an industrial fishery, not really a food fishery, though. The early Long Island fishermen ate Menhaden regularly. How many people in this room have ever had a Menhaden? Please stand. <laughs> my, my graduate student, Carolyn Hall, when we first began this a good number of years ago, I made a deal with her. I said, when I finally publish this work, you and I are going to have a Menhaden dinner. She has now moved back to Brooklyn, <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to find her if I ever finish. Native American use of Menhaden. You've all heard the legend of Squanto, the uh, Native American who came out of the cold, chilly forests uh, at Plymouth Rock and taught the uh, Mayflower folks how to plant corn to fertilize their crops. This is probably an apocryphal story. If you look into the literature of how Native Americans on the east coast of North America did their farming, they made very little, apparently, use of fertilizer. They had a crop rotation. They had a field rotation. But they did not regularly fertilize. Where did Squanto get the idea of fertilizing fields with fish? 
probably not Menhaden, probably Alewife. Well, it turns out that before he met the people at Plymouth Rock, Squanto had been kidnapped. He had been kidnapped and brought back to Europe and spent some time in the Mallorcas. He spent some time in uh, Britain. And he finally escaped and took a boat to, of all places, Newfoundland. In all of three of those places, they use fish as fertilizer. So when he came out of the woods, suggested to the, the uh, pilgrims that they fertilize with fish, not necessarily reflective of a standing Native American practice, probably unique to Squanto. Native Americans fish primar primarily in streams, narrow, shallow streams with weirs, weirs that were either rock or brush, and that trapped fish coming down uh, either with the tide or with the flow of the stream. Menhaden typically don't go very far up into these shallow coastal streams. And uh, it's unlikely that most Native American fishers had the ability to catch Menhaden regularly in any large numbers for use as fertilizer. However, there was no doubt that sometime after the revolution, Long Islanders began to fish specifically more for Menhaden for use as farm fertilizer. Uh, prior to that, small amounts of the fish were used as bait and food and fertilizer in New England. Our soils here on Long Island were richer than New England. And the need for fertilizer in New England preceded the need here. Their soils are even worse than ours were. They've been harvested for bait and food on Long Island for a long time. The bait uh, was used primarily in the uh, line fisheries for certain fish and in the pot fisheries for lobsters. There's no documented use of Menhaden fertilizer on Long Island until after the Revolution. Long Islanders used very little fertilizer before the Revolution of any sort. Usually, what they did use was farmyard manure. Long Island soils, however, and this is true of the entire East Coast, were becoming impoverished by the late 18th century, and the farmers were looking to do something about that. They were looking for fertilizers. Where did the practice of seining from Hayden, which became a very big deal on Long Island, actually begin? From what I've been able to piece together, it probably began as a, uh, a derivative of an, of an earlier fishery, a fishery beach seining for porpoises, the harbor porpoise, which once used to be much more numerous in our local waters than it is now. And uh, the colonial farmers, uh, pre-colonial farmers, would seine them. How would they seine them? They would lay a big line of net out parallel to the shore 100 yards, 150 yards. Porpoises would swim by, usually chasing Menhaden. When they got in the middle of that run of the net, a crew behind them and a crew in front of them would run out with boats trailing other pieces of net. They'd tie the net together. They had enclosed the porpoises in a rectangle of net, and they pulled it all into shore. The porpoises uh, were chasing the Menhaden. The Menhaden would go right through the net because the mesh on the porpoise net was huge. Eventually, porpoise numbers began to drop because of the, uh, the reduction of the, of the harvest. Porpoises can't take a lot of fishing. Uh, but the Menhaden were still there. And I believe what happened was when uh, they got tired of waiting around for the porpoises to show up after the uh, revolution, and they needed some fertilizer because the soils were getting depleted, they turned to the Menhaden here on Long Island. There's the porpoise that they were looking for, the little harbor porpoise. Porpoises were used mainly for leather, for food, and most particularly for their jaw oil. The oil of the lower jaw of the porpoise uh, lubricated many, many, many fine pieces of machinery in the 18th century, including fine watches. It was the best lubricating oil available uh, at that period of time. Eventually on Long Island, the pursuit of Maiden, Manhattan with Beach Sandy got very organized. Fisher farming groups would form uh, gangs or companies, 10 to 20 men in a company. You bought in, cost you $1,000, which was a lot of money back then, to buy in for a full share in a gang. The nets were immense. The nets would stretch from here, certainly, to William Floyd Parkway. Uh, 
perhaps to the expressway. That's just the meshed part of the net. There are equally long bridles on each side. One net that they used was a mile, uh, mile and three quarters in Akabog. The companies used scows to deploy the net. They lived on a weekly basis in a seaside rough hewn fish house. I'll tell you about the horses in a bit. And they gave, them, say, they gave themselves kind of interesting names. They were the Weedles, the Coots, the Mud Fudgeons. Down in uh, Town Harbor in the South Hole, there were the Coots. Uh, so these were fairly young men, and they had time on their hands waiting for the Menhaden to show up. So they came up with these interesting names. There they are drawing the same. So they see a school of Menhaden. And at the time, and this was beginning in about 1790 through about 1860, 1870, Many of the promontories on Long Island's coastal uh, shoreline had large poles stuck up. Because if they saw a real big school of Menhaden, there weren't enough of them on duty to go get it. And they had to alert the farmers to get down to the shore and help them. So they'd run up a, a peach basket, or a tin pail, or some a ladies' bloomers up onto the pole. And that would be the sign to gather by the beach because a big school was coming in. So they row out to the school. They get ahead of the school. The Menhaden schools are tightly compact surface swimming schools. The, the net is in the stern of each of the scows. They're rowing out together. They get on the far side of the school. They separate. And they ring the, the, uh, the school with the net. They cannot simply row that net in with a huge school of Menhaden trapped inside it, a physical impossibility. What did they do? They had the long bridles. They'd row those bridles ashore, lining the shore of all the Menhaden staining beaches on Long Island were permanently installed big 8x8, 10x10 posts. They would drop a collar over the post, drop a capstan over the collar, and have a horse winch the nets in. That's how they retrieved the nets. They fished from May to June, and August, August and September. It wasn't uncommon to catch up to a million fish at a pop. They used standard size carts with volumetric marks. In the Menhaden fishery, uh, how many you catch is what counts, because money changes hands based on how many you've caught. They had to have a ready way of figuring out how many they caught. They used to count them out by hand. This became nuts when they got a real big catch. So some enterprising farmer decided, why don't we just figure out the average volume of Menhaden, figure out where a line on the cart would be that would represent 1,000 Menhaden, 1,500 Menhaden, 2,000 Menhaden, and then we just have to count the cart loads. And that's what they did. They used the Menhaden for fertilizer initially. They knew the fish was oily. And uh, there were socioeconomic factors at work in the early decades of the 19th century that made that oil increasingly valuable. And they began to look at Menhaden primarily then as a source of oil. 1947, at Jessup's Neck, the Morton Wildlife Refuge Peninsula, was the site of the first pot works where a Long Islander tried to extract the oil from the oily Menhaden. Menhaden are about the, one of the oiliest fish in the sea. The simple pot works were what you would see on the deck of the Pequot in Moby Dick. A big iron tripod, a wood fire under it, and as the blubber boils, the lighter oil surfaces to the top and you decant it off. And that was the basis of the initial Menhaden pot works. The first major refinement was that uh, open fires are a really inefficient way to cook things. And uh, steam was introduced uh, fairly early on. 1941, the first steam-powered Menhaden reduction facility was built up on uh, Narragansett Bay in Portsmouth. 19, 1850, 4th of July, the first steam-powered Menhaden factory on Long Island at Checkit Point. Uh, this is on, Stat on Shelter Island, basically right where the ferry came in, or comes in now, actually. And the introduction of steam power took the reduction of raw Menhaden into products of value from a cottage industry, which it had been 
up until about 1860, into a large scale, scale commercial enterprise. And there are a number of things under uh, happening in the uh, middle decades of the 19th century that propelled this injury, industry into a very, very uh, significant part of the coastal economy here in New York and elsewhere. First was the industrialization and the Civil War drove up the demand for oil, um, any kind of oil, and the price for oil was high. Secondly, the source of historically most of the country's oil, the whaling industry, was in decline. The American farmers who were looking to supplement the fertility of their soils for a relatively brief period of time turned to Peruvian guano, bird guano, imported beginning in about 1840 into the United States and 1848 here in New York. Uh, but that supply was A, expensive, and B, once it was nationalized by the Peruvian government, quite irregular. And uh, Millard Fillmore, the president in 1850, was petitioned by the American farmers to do something about this, and he actually mentioned bird guano in his State of the State address. Uh, the only time I think that has happened. And then lastly, the final factor and the most important factor that made it all possible is that a beach seine fishery is inherently limited. I don't care how big your net is, you ultimately can only catch fish that were within a certain distance of shore. Most of the fish didn't come that close to shore. You needed a net that could be deployed effectively and work effectively in open waters, and that is the purse seine. The purse seine is a panel net that has floats at the top, iron rings at the bottom, with a line running through the bottom. You encircle a school of fish, and you drop a weight, initially in this fishery, down those two, bo bo two bites of the bottom line. As it slides down, it draws the bottom of the net together and purses it, and now you have a bag of floating net encasing a school of Manhattan, and you pull that in. And that's what you need if you're going to um, pursue Manhattan away from the shore. So the Manhattan fishery goes to sea. Beach seines are inadequate. The fishery moves offshore. What do you need? You need a 5 to 15 ton sloop. It's 1860, 1870. You need two seine boats. You need a striker boat and one or two carryaways. Carryaways are the boats that are designed to take the fish from the net back to the factory. Meanwhile, the sloop and the seine boats go look for another school. Here's the crew, the captain, the mate, the cook, and 10 to 14 fishermen. Here's the drill. You find the school. You set the seine around the school with the two boats. You purse the seine. You haul the seine. The striker is on the far side of the net in a little cockle shell boat, because sometimes Menhaden, when they feel the seine getting too close around them, will try and rush the far side of the net and get out. The striker is there to pull the net, net, that floating line, up over the bow of his little cockle boat and keep the fish from doing that. When the net's hardened, when you've got the net pulled in so that it's mostly fish and not so much water, you call the carryaways in. They sail in. Each carryaway has a block and tackle on its mast. They have a big dip net, and they dip the net, the fish from the hardened net, into the carryaway, and away the carryaway goes to the factory. And there they are at the masthead, looking for a school of Menhaden. You don't do this at night for two reasons. Menhaden don't swim at the surface at night, and you can't see them at night. So it was a daytime fishery. You're pursing the seine here, and there the carryaway is heading off to the factory. Usually there are two carryaways because if you only had one carryaway, you couldn't do too much with your seine and scows until the carryaway came back from the factory. And sometimes it was eight or ten miles to the, the closest factory. And there's a factory. Uh, these uh, prints, by the way, these engravings come from a beautiful. Uh, U.S. government fishery report from 1877. Uh, amazing the detail and the beauty of some of the drawings in these early governmental reports. Uh, 
That's actually the east side, looking towards Montauk, of Napig Harbor, which was the site of one of the earliest Manhattan factory concentrations. There were at one time four Manhattan factories on the east side of Napig Harbor. The west side's too shoal uh, to allow the boats to get in and out of factories over there. So that's the, uh, the middle factory at Napig in about uh, 1870. What do you do when you get the fish to the factory? You cook it. You press it. You collect the liquid and decant the oil, and you've got the scrap to worry about, the fish flesh. You dry it. You grind it. You bag it. And then you sell both. The fish scrap goes for fertilizer, and the oil goes to an oil refiner and is used to tan leather. It's used to make soap. Some of it goes to Europe and is used as edible human oil and uh, cooking oil in uh, Europe. And it became a very, very, very big business. There are a number of concentrations of Manhattan processing activity on Long Island that developed in the middle decades of the 19th century. Barren Island, furthest west, we know it today as Floyd Bennett Field. The Sayville area in Fire Island, initially on the north side of the bay with small pot works, but it's a long way up from the fishing grounds just outside the inlets or just inside the inlets up to the North Shore, and eventually the factories in Patchogue moved down to the beach, to Fire Island. The Peconic Bays, generally that indented shoreline of the Peconic Bays, lots of areas to set up a factory. Shelter Island, and then lastly, and most importantly, Napig Harbor and Promised Land on the South Fork, east of Amagansett. There's a plot of the number of such plants in New York, and you see it comes to a peak in the 1870s. And then there was this tremendous expansion, but it overheated. Uh, there was a market for oil, but not that great of a market and the factories began to, in essence, gobble each other up, with the less productive being absorbed by the, uh, the more productive factories. And eventually, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit, uh, we came to a situation, really, there was only one factory in New York. That factory operated at Promised Land from 1933 to 1968. The Manhattan fishery at sea began in the waning days of the age of sail. The sailboats were quickly supplanted by steamers. 1869, steamers were first used to tow the carryaways back to the, to the plant. You don't have to worry about the wind. Steamers are great in that way. And then somebody got the bright idea to build a steamer that could carry the fish itself. You didn't need the carryaways at all. And so the steamers uh, entered the fishery in about 1872. There's a typical steamer, distinctive kind of a rakish looking boat, a Manhattan steamer is, high bow, kind of low in the midships, engine in the stern, tall pilot house, big tall mast with a crow's nest usually at the top so you can get up high off the water and look for those schools, and then a block and tackle boom situation to take the fish out of the hardened net and dump it into your hold in the midships. And that's the uh, kind of design of steamers that has been in place since the very get-go. Impact of steamers. If you have a big factory, you're entering, this is a big industry now. This is not a mom and pop operation. You need regular supply. Steamer can give you a regular supply of fish. Fishermen used to own the sloops and the carryaways. Fishermen didn't have enough money to own a steamer. Only the factory owners, who were businessmen, owned the steamers. And so the vertical integration of this industry began with the steamers and the cost of the steamers. Small, a steamer could cost as much or more than a small factory. Not enough fac factories could really afford a steamer. And so the number of factories began to decline. And there's some typical statistics showing uh, that by 1895, there's only seven factories left in New York. 1897, 
Some Brits came across. They had a patent on an Irish fish processing system that they were going to introduce into the lucrative Menhaden fishery on the East Coast. They felt quite confident that this mechanized approach to catching and particularly reducing Menhaden uh, was something that the American uh, factory owners could not compete with. The American owners got together. They sent one of their own over to England to look at the system. That man came back and he said, fellas, the handwriting is on the wall. And by 1898, this syndicate had bought up virtually all of the factories reducing Menhaden north of Delaware. They were forestalled from doing this in the Chesapeake. And by this time, the fishery was shifting south to the Chesapeake in the Mid-Atlantic because there's ownership laws in the Chesapeake and Virginia whereby you have to be a state resident to process Menhaden or to catch Menhaden. And this was something that this English syndicate couldn't at that, po at that point deal with. So the American Fisheries Company purchased all, 18, all eight factories in New York, closed and dismantled five of them, and left the three factories that by that time were operating at Promised Land as the only factories operating in New York. There were smaller plants at Barron Island and Fire Island. They were not owned by the American Fisheries Company, and they were not to last very long. I mentioned that the fishery moved south, and this is a plot showing the shift in the distribution of the catch between the mid-Atlantic, uh, South Atlantic, Chesapeake, and whatever over time. And you can see that the Chesapeake and South Atlantic became progressively more important and uh, uh, be eventually became the center of this industry. The actual process for catching and reducing Menhaden had been set by about 1880. The, the uh, improvements since that time have really been simply improvements in efficiency and scale to be able to catch more fish and process them more quickly, not process them really in a different way. So I'm just going to run through some of the technological improvements that uh, made this industry such a huge one in the middle decades of the 20th century. Firstly, uh, steam power is great, but diesel is even better for a number of reasons if you're a boat owner. And uh, this industry was penetrated by gas and diesel-powered uh, steamers fairly early on. Your steamer's at the dock. You've got 40 tons of Menhaden in a big mass in your hold. How do you get it out of there? Initially, you send the ball gang down, and they shovel it into bins, lower down and lift it up singly out of the hold. That takes a long time. Somebody invents the continuous fish elevator. You drop the elevator into the hold. It's a never-ending series of buckets. You just shovel into the buckets. And as the fish come up, they get dumped into a cart off to the factory. And there's a fish elevator at the Promised Land factory off to the right there in 1902. Initially, the cooking of the fish in the factories was done in single vats. That is a slow, uh, laborious process. It needed to be mechanized. The continuous steam cooker was developed just before the turn of the century. You basically have a conveyor belt that leads to this entry box at the beginning of the steam cooker. And there's steam running through those pipes. There's a screw inside the enclosure. As the fish land in, they are moved down by the screw uh, to the end of the thing and cooked on their way. Continuous screw press is basically the same thing. You come out of the cooker, you're on a conveyor belt, you're dropped into the bin of the, of the screw press, another screw, but the diameter of the tube that it's inside of is getting narrower as it approaches the end, and this increases the pressure on the fish flesh and squeezes the oil out of it. They used to dry the fish, the scrap rather, coming out of the presses, by spreading them out onto big wooden platforms, two or three acres, four acres in extent. It's an iffy process. If it rains, it smells, uh, there's got to be a better way. The better way are these automatic forced hot air dryers that were introduced into the industry uh, before 1910. 
There's a small one at the Promised Land factories, which were the largest factories in the United States, largest fish processing facility in the world. They were that big. There's a man standing back there, and there were six of them at each of the three factories. Tremendous, huge capacity dryers. Pulling the net up by hand is not for the faint of heart. There's got to be a better way than to pull this net up by hand. It took until 1956 until a Hungarian immigrant, Mario Puretek, invented the power block. There's two seine boats with a mast and a power block at the top. You feed the seine lines through the power block, the motor pulls the net in. You reduce your uh, harvest time, you reduce your crew size. It's a real money saver. Synthetic nets, anything's better than a big, heavy, bulky, tarred cotton net. Nylon nets came in about 1954. Even a fish ladder, the elevator, takes more time than you'd like it. 1947 pneumatic pumps mounted on the steamers would transfer the fish from the hardened net into the steamer's hold. Those same pumps would turn around and push the fish out of the hold into the factory. Radar, which was, if you were at sea, is just a great thing to, to have, no matter what you're doing. And vessel refrigeration in the 1960s, it does not take long, as you know, from Menhaden to spoil. Spoiled Menhaden does not process well. And if you're in an industry that already has odor problems, you want, you want to keep your spoiled, spoilage rate to a minimum. So vessel refrigeration started in the Gulf of Mexico fishery, but uh, was widespread in the East Coast fishery by the 1960s. What happened at Promised Land? Well, the industry concentrated there beginning in 1900, basically. That was the only game in town. And there were two very, very large factories um, operating there through 1931. Uh, eventually, both of them burned. Uh, these factories, of course, were basically wood. They were absolutely suffused with fish oil and scales, and they were a conflagration waiting to happen. And it happened very often. There were no factories operating between 1931 and 1933 at Promised Land, but then the Smith family, who were really making a name for themselves in the East Coast Manhattan fishery, bought one of the Promised Land factories, the remnants of it, in 1933, and they opened the Smith Meal Company plant at Promised Land and ran it until 1968. 1968, the East Coast Manhattan population was in a severe downturn because of overharvesting in the Chesapeake Bay of very young fish. We're at the northern end, towards the northern end of the range of the Manhattan. When you overharvest a population, it tends to shrink its geographic range. We used to get the big, long-distance uh, migrants up here. But when you fish too many two-year-old fish in the Chesapeake, Long Island runs out of fish. And that's what basically happened to the Promised Land plant in the 60s. Today, there's only one factory left, Reedville, Virginia. There is a small gillnet fishery in New York for bait. And for the first time, uh, very recently, the management of Manhattan on the East Coast is taking on a scientific aspect. It has been very much either unregulated entirely or a seat of the pants approach. But in 19, uh, 2012, uh, based on a concern that this is a species that's so critical in the overall ecosystem of our coastal waters that we simply can't keep on harvesting huge numbers of this fish and think we're not impacting that ecosystem. It was decided to limit the catch uh, and then now to reduce the catch by 25% over what it was in 2011. And I would feel that this concept Perhaps here is a fish who is more, worth more to us alive in the sea than dead and pressed out for its constituent chemicals and such uh, may dictate the future of Manhattan fishing on the, on the East Coast. Not that the fishery would uh, disappear completely, but it would come under increasingly strict regulation to conserve the ecosystem function of this uh, very, very important uh, but largely unrecognized fish. So that concludes my presentation. <laughs>
If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. The Menhaden that are caught today go into primarily uh, pet foods, uh, and uh, for the past, uh, pet foods, agricultural feeds, and for the past 25 or 30 years, uh, omega-3 fatty acid uh, supplements. And you know that's a big thing that the, the uh, omega protein says. Look, we're making the a, a product that keeps people alive. Don't toss us aside so readily. Yes, ma'am. If you would use the aisle mics, please. Initially, uh, when those uh, small factories were first built, they would fish uh, largely in the Peconic Bay system. Uh, but as the number of factories shrank and each factory got larger, they needed more and more fish, and this propelled the steamers further out, and they ended up fishing most of the time in the ocean. Certainly in the beach seine fishery days, they were fishing in, in the bay, so they did fish the ocean beaches 